Let's start taking a look at chemical reactions. In this first part, mainly an introduction um, and a refresher about how to name ionic and covalent bonds and then start putting them together in a chemical reaction. In part two, um, we'll review how to make the skeleton equation from a word equation, and then part three, we'll turn those into balanced chemical equations. So let's take a look at part one here with the introduction. A few things we need to know ahead of time are indications of chemical reactions. So if you're working in the lab, you need to be able to recognize a chemical reaction when it occurs, mainly through observation. One way that will help you out is um, if, if energy is absorbed or released, so that can be detected by temperature. Also, flame and heat is a good indicator that energy is being released in an exothermic reaction. Color change is a good indicator as well. Um, in this case, you see up here, we've used indicator to change the color of the solution as we change the pH of the solution. So color change is an example of a chemical reaction or an indicator that one has occurred. Odor change is another one. I have a picture of garbage up here, which is a pretty good example. If you've ever been to the city dump or if you've smelled the garbage can out back of your house, there are some definite chemical reactions that are happening inside your trash. And then another one is a precipitate or a precipitate. In this case, a solid is forming down there in the bottom of the test tube, um, and that is another indicator of a chemical reaction. So we'll look at all those in, in examples a little more closely. For the example here, I'm going to use methane and oxygen. This is what happens when you burn natural gas. If you're working in the chemistry lab, oftentimes your natural gas is methane. It combines with oxygen to form heat and light, which makes your Bunsen burner work releases carbon dioxide and water vapor. So we've got two parts when we're dealing with chemical reactions. The first thing we have are the reactants. In this case we have methane and oxygen. Um, and then we also have the products. So the products is whatever you end up with. In the case of our example up here that would be carbon dioxide and water. So the reactants turn into the products and one thing that's very important when we start drawing out these equations, and especially the balanced chemical equations, we need to show that the reactants turn into products. We'll use that symbol right there, and I'll go through all the symbols um, in, in a, one of the following slides. So in a chemical reaction, all we're doing is we're looking at the way the atoms are joined together and how that has changed. So we're not creating atoms, we're not taking atoms apart, we're not, say, combining two hydrogens to make a helium, um, if two hydrogens are bonded together, then it would become H2. So you need to keep that in mind, that we're not creating or destroying any matter. That'll be important when we start balancing equations again. So we can look at these chemical um, equations a couple different ways. We're going to start off with one of the most common ways they're presented is in a sentence. In this case, copper reacts with chlorine to form copper 2 chloride. When we turn that into a word equation, we need to understand some symbols. We have copper plus chlorine reacts to form, that's what the arrow means, copper to chloride. And there's a picture of copper to chloride crystals down at the bottom. So let's dissect this a little more and look at the symbols that we need to know to be able to write out these sort of reactions. We use the arrow in between the reactants and the products to indicate what direction the reaction occurs from the reactants to the products. If you read in a word equation where it says reacts to form or yields, that's when we use the arrow to show our reactants turning into our products. The plus sign is used um, when we see the word and. So if we're combining two things or if we have two reactants on one side, two products on the other, oftentimes the word and will give us an indication that um, we need to have a plus sign in there. And then we need to show the state of each of the reactants and the products involved. So we use um, S in parentheses, G in parentheses, and L in parentheses to show the state. And one other very important one is aqueous, which is the AQ shown there. This is when something is dissolved in water. For example, we might be using um, sodium chloride, which is dissolved in water, table salt. We would need to show that we're not using solid sodium chloride in our reaction. We're using sodium chloride inside the water or salt water. Another good example of this is acids. All acids are aqueous solutions. They have to be an aqueous so solution to be an acid. Another symbol we need is uh, this 
double arrow on either side indicates that the reaction is reversible, which means the reactants can turn into the products. Those products can become the reactants and turn back into that same um, product or what was initially the reactant. We also oftentimes need to show if we had to apply something to get the reaction to occur. So if we had to use heat to get the reaction to start or fire or uh, some sort of change, which is the delta symbol down there, we oftentimes need to show that. Also, if there is a catalyst used to help speed up or slow down the reaction, we need to say what the catalyst was. For example, if you were doing an experiment and you needed to speed up whatever reaction was happening, so you put in little filings of platinum to cause that reaction to speed up, you'd need to show that platinum was used and we write that directly over the arrow. Just a reminder of what a catalyst is, it's any substance that speeds up or slows down a reaction. So it changes the rate at which the reaction occurs. Um, these happen all the time, or catalysts exist all over in your body, which creates, especially in metabolism and um, catabolism, to try to get the energy out of the food that you're eating. So let's go into how we name um, compounds and how we're going to start turning those into formulas. Hopefully this is review. If it's not, you'll need to find, um, you'll need to work your way backwards into ionic and covalent bonding and figure out how to name those molecules before you're going to be able to do these chemical equations. So let's start off with the first one here. We've got Na2CO3. And I put up on the screen covalent or ionic. And the reason I put that is, I think especially starting off here, you need to be able to recognize, am I dealing with covalent or am I dealing with ionic? because we name ionic and covalent compounds differently. So we look up at the one we have here. We have sodium and we have carbonate. Now I've added something onto the screen here and this is something that we have on the back of our periodic table. It's the symbols and names of common polyatomic ions. So I see a polyatomic ion on, on this which is why um, I've put that up there on the screen. You just have to start recognizing them. If we look at sodium Sodium is way over here on the periodic table. And then we also know that this CO3 here, after some practice, is a polyatomic ion. CO3, when we look at our chart, is carbonate. So carbonate is CO3 2 minus, CO3 2 minus. In some cases you may have those memorized, in some cases you may not. When I look up sodium, so let's fill this out. Sodium, when I look up the oxidation state, you'll need a periodic table to do that. It shows that sodium is 1 plus. That's the charge it's going to have when it starts to bond together. The carbonate, that CO3, is 2 minus. So I need to have two of these 1 pluses right here to even out that 2 minus, which means I have Na2CO3. And because I've had to um, form this ionically, I should be able to now name this, that this is sodium carbonate. Sodium carbonate. Now, one good indicator that it's an, a covalent bond, if it was a covalent bond, um, we would need to say how many of each element were in there. So, let's go ahead and take a look at some, at a covalent bond. We've got um, sulfur and we've got four chlorines bonded together. Now these are covalently bonded together. Um, we can figure that out by looking at their electronegativity. And another dead giveaway is that sulfur and chlorine are right next to each other. Their electronegativities are very close, which means the sulfur isn't strong enough to pull electrons away from the chlorine and the chlorine isn't strong enough to pull electrons away from the sulfur. So they have to share. That's what a covalent bond is. Now that we know it's a covalent bond, we know we have to name it differently. So sulfur, and we don't have to put mono in front of the first one because that's one of the rules of naming covalent bond compounds. But the chlorine, we've got four of them. So we need to say how many we have. Tetra is the prefix for four. Tetra chloride. So we have sulfur tetrachloride. Next one, we've got NH4OH. And again, 
You just need to start recognizing when you see polyatomic ions, and NH4 is indeed a polyatomic ion. NH4 is the ammonium ion, and OH is the hydroxide ion. They're both right here next to each other on my chart. These can be found on the internet too if you've forgotten yours or you don't have one. So the NH4 and the OH, which means if these are ions, they're ionically bonded, and I don't need to say how many I have. I just need to name the molecule. In this case, we have ammonium, hydroxide. Okay, switching gears. Um, if we go, if we start naming these out or writing the formulas out from them, now I have hydrogen iodide. So hydrogen iodide, it does not dis not say anything with mono. It doesn't say mono iodide or dihyodide or um, trihydrogen, which means this is probably a good indicator of an ionically bonded molecule. If that's the case, I need to look up the oxidation states on my periodic table. Let's take a look at hydrogen iodide. We've got hydrogen here, and we've got iodine way over here. These are ionically bonded together. We would know it's covalently bonded if it said something like hydrogen monoiodide or hydrogen diiodide or dihydrogen iodide, something to that effect. But it doesn't have any of those prefixes, which is a good indicator that it's ionically bonded. So we've got hydrogen. We need to look up the oxidation state for hydrogen, 1 plus. And for iodine, iodine, we have 1 minus. So we end up with this. Hydrogen iodide. Let's try chlorine dioxide. Now we've got a pretty good indicator right here. The di tells us that this is probably covalently bonded. Indeed it is. So we just need to write out what we have. We don't have to look up anything on the periodic table. We've got chlorine and we've got two oxygens. Chlorine dioxide. So in part two, we're going to start making skeleton, skeleton equations out of the word equations. And then in part three, we will take the skeleton equations and turn those into balanced chemical equations. So good luck.